We have been in a series called uh, Return to Serve, Return to Serve in the month of February. In part one, we talked about the reason why we serve, and we serve because of our mission. We serve because um, served people serve people. Last week and week two, Pastor Chris talked about the benefits that we find in serving, that our relationship with Christ is, is vertical, but it's also horizontal, and there are benefits by being connected to the body of Christ and serving together, and if you missed last week or our first week, and you can both go back and you can watch those online, our key scripture verse um, in this series is Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18, it'll be on the screens. Nehemiah is talking to the leadership um, in Israel at the time, and here's what he says. I told them that the hand of my God had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, uh, these are the leaders, they said, let us rise up and build so they strengthen their hands for the good work. And uh, Nehemiah and the the Israelites that were rebuilding the wall, they were doing a, a good work. They were a part of a good work. And uh, I don't know about you, but I know um, I am so thankful to be a part of a church where I believe is, is doing a good, good work. You know, it's incredible to make an impact in somebody's life. It's incredible to be a blessing to somebody, but it is so much more incredible to make an eternal impact in somebody's life, to see them move from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. That is the greatest, greatest impact that we can make. And I believe, you know, I may be biased, but I think that, that there is a good work happening here at Victory Christian Center at our Coitsville campus. I mean, every Wednesday night, if, if, if you don't know, we have a great time in the presence of God every Wednesday night. Uh, in the youth center. I have heard that the youth pastor is just on fire. You know, I heard he's just crazy, wildly handsome and charming. I've heard so many great things about him. Um, but the youth ministry, we, we love God. We're going after God. You should see our kids worship. Last night we had um, our young adults gathering in the youth center. You know, good things are happening in our young adults. I think that we have the best kids ministry in the nation with Pastor Mike and Savannah at Creation Station. They're doing an incredible, incredible job. There's a good, good work that is happening. And people every, uh, every month, year over year, are saying yes to Jesus. We serve people every single month food. There's, there's so many good things that are happening here. And I believe that we are a part of a good work. But hey, I might be biased. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want to show you. I actually got 33 reasons to show you that God is doing a good work here at Victory Christian Center. On the first Sunday of every month, we have our Victory Nights. And, and our first Sunday in March at our Victory Night, it was a baptism Sunday. And we saw 33 people go public in their faith. It was so, so powerful, man. To see them come up out of that watery grave um, and just see the resurrection power of Jesus still at work. So I want to show you a quick video so that you can see that what we are a part of is a good, good work. Check it out.
Come on, can we just celebrate what Jesus is doing? Come on, I'm telling you, He's doing a good work. He's doing a good work. This is still His church, right? He still saves. He still heals. He still delivers. And we are a part of a good, good work. Amen? Amen. Hey, if you've got your Bibles this morning, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 4. We're going to start in Luke chapter 4, and then we'll end uh, in Isaiah 61. Luke chapter 4, and then we will end in Isaiah 61. Man, I love that song. That was good. That was so good. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16. Are you ready? All right. Here we go. Uh, It says, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him, so he unrolled the scroll. He found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. The blind will see, and the oppressed will be set free, and the time of the Lord's favor has come. So thankful. Then he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently, and then he began to speak to them. The scripture that you've just read has been fulfilled this very day. The title of the message is Return to Serve, Part 3, Jesus is Our Nehemiah. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your word. God, we declare your word is true and every man is a liar. We pray that you would speak to us today through your word. We pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. We thank you, God, for your word. And we ask you that you would speak to each and every one of us in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said... Amen. Jesus, he rolls up the scroll. He hands it back to the attendant. He sits down. Everybody is looking at him. And then he says, the scripture that you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. And I just want to tell you that everything that we need is found in Jesus. Everything that we need for life and for godliness is found in Jesus. 700 years before Jesus is reading this prophecy from this scroll, Isaiah is looking down the corridor of the future and he is writing about the messianic Messiah and he is, he is writing about the mission that he is going to come and do and accomplish. And then Jesus shows up on the scene and he is saying everything that Isaiah was writing about, everything that Ezekiel was pointing to, everything that Jeremiah was looking forward to, everything that was written in the law and the prophets, it all points to me. It is, it is being fulfilled this very day. Man, I love the, I love the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because it is over and over over and again how we could not get to God. How we on our best day, all of our righteousness was like filthy rags. But God was so good that he stepped out of eternity. He wrapped himself in humanity and he came down to us. The whole Old Testament is looking forward to the day when we can finally be back in right relationship with God. And Jesus is reading from the scroll in Isaiah 61. And he says, everything that has been written has been fulfilled this very day because I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The whole Old Testament, it points and it prophesies to the coming of Jesus. And what we've been reading about in Ezra and Nehemiah and what we've been studying and this year is no different. If you haven't had a chance to follow along on our reading plan, the, the Ezra Nehemiah reading plan is on our website. We have some hard copies uh, available in our, light, in our welcome center. I encourage you to grab those and read them and follow along in the story. But 
What happened was Israel dis disobeyed God for a number of years. And so they were forced into a ba Babylonian captivity. And they were exiled out of the land that God had given them, out of the promised land. Then after 70 years, there were three different waves that came back. Three different waves of, of Israelite people that came back to reestablish life in Jerusalem. And the first wave was Zerubbabel, and he built the temple. He relayed the foundation of the temple and rebuilt the temple. Then Ezra in the second wave comes back to teach the Torah and rebuild the community of God. And then when we've been looking at is we've been studying, Nehemiah was in the third wave of people that were coming back to rebuild the walls. But the parallel is that all of it points to and prophesies to Jesus. In the same way that um, Nehemiah is building the wall, and in, in the same way that God is restoring the work and that these exiles are returning, they are returning from exile to the promised land to rebuild and reestablish the work is the same parallel that we believe that God has spoken to us that this year is the year of the great return. That this is the year where we return to make the main thing the main thing. That we return the church back to Jesus because it's his. It's not ours. It has always belonged to him. The days of the church being about a superstar, celebrity preacher, those days have got to go. I've seen so I know that you have as well, seen so many people turned off from the beautiful message of the gospel because we have made it about a people or a person or a tribe. We have made it about something other than what it was all about. This is the year where we return the church back to Jesus and we make him uh, what he has always been, the center of it all. So we want to, re this is the year of the return. We want to return the church back to Jesus. We want to return back to church. We want to return to serve. That's our emphasis this month. We want to return to the word. That's why we're doing these initiatives to encourage you to read your Bible and follow along in different reading plans. And we want to return to prayer. We want this to be the year of the return. So we've been following this parallel that everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything in Nehemiah and Ezra it points to Jesus. And so number one for today is Jesus is our Nehemiah. He is our Nehemiah. In the same way Nehemiah shows up in Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, God is building his church. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says it like this. So you Gentiles, that's you and me, we're no longer strangers and foreigners, but we are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together, we are his house. Y'all see it? We are his house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. I want to say it again. Jesus is our Nehemiah. Nehemiah returned to build a wall. But Jesus is our Nehemiah. And together on the, on the foundation of the apostle and the prophet. With Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Together we are his house. Like it takes all of us together. All of us together are his house. Jesus is our Nehemiah. Amen? That together we make up the body of Christ. Man, I love that. But Jesus is not just our Nehemiah. Jesus, if you follow the parallel, he's not just concerned about what's going on from a hundred foot view of the wall, Jesus cares about each individual brick and stone 
of that wall. So Jesus is not just our Nehemiah. Jesus is my Nehemiah. And that's number two. Jesus is your Nehemiah. Not only are you a part of something that is bigger than yourself, not only am I a part of the capital C church, not only am I a part of the body of God, I, as an individual, I matter to God. Amen? You matter to God. Jesus is your Nehemiah. And, and, and over the last couple of weeks, Pastor Chris has been doing a class on Wednesday nights called Rebuilding the Real You. And he has been showing in this class the parallel of what God wants to do, how he wants to rebuild and restore the walls of your life so you can be who God has called you to be. But it just speaks to how amazing, amazing Jesus is. Listen, he holds the whole cosmos in his hands. Yet he cares enough for you and for me. He holds the whole world together. Yet he bends down and he listens to my prayer. You know what I mean? Like, who am I to God? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm one of billions, right? But he is so good that I matter to him. He cares for the temple. He cares for the wall that is being built. But he cares for each and every one of us. He's not just our Nehemiah. He is my Nehemiah. He is your Nehemiah. And he wants to do a great work on the inside of you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 says it like this. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. Verse 5. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer sacrifices that please God. What I want you to see, what I want you to understand is that your individual story, it matters to God. He says that you are a living stone. You are a holy priest. You offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Your story matters to God. He doesn't just care about the wall. He doesn't just care about the church that he is building. He cares for you and for me. And I think sometimes what we can look at is we can, we can get into a room like this. Or we can look at the capital C church and we can think it is doing just fine without me. Or it's doing just fine without you. But I'm telling you, Jesus cares for your place, for your brick, for your stone in the wall because it matters to him. Your story matters to him. You matter to him. And so we have to do the work of renewing the mind and living according to the new heart so that whatever our place is in the wall, we find it and we don't lay, let our past keep us a hostage from finding our place in the wall. Amen. Let me give you, a, let me give you an, a, a little example, right? I've been married 11 years. Um, yeah, come on now. Your boy's doing good. 11 years now. Um, when me and Tiffany, we were married for four years, we decided we want to try to start a family. So we had Cana. God gave us a little, little girl first. My daughter, she's seven. Um, she is the sweetest little girl like that I have ever met. I know that there's sweet girls out there, but I may be biased, but I just think she's the sweetest little girl. Mommy, am I right or am I right? You know, she's biased too. You know what I'm saying? But, um... She is such a sweet girl. And uh, I remember thinking when God gave us Cana, I was thinking, man, everything that I could ever want in a daughter, God gave it to me uh, in this girl. I love her. Like, she's perfect. And I remember um, we, she was about two years old. And, you know, once you have, like, a kid, that everyone's like, so how many are you going to have? And when's the next one going to come? It's like, a, it's like a joke. But it's like, you know, like, 
I, ain't, I haven't slept in seven years. You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. Um, so after about two years, uh, we, had a, we, had, we had another kid. But here, here's what's interesting. I thought that everything was just perfect when we had Cana. I thought the, the wall and the house of my family was complete with just Cana. And then God gave us Enoch. And my son came. And then I didn't realize how amazing, like I didn't know how good it could be with, it, with another one, right? Right? Now, Enoch is my boy. He's like a Tasmanian devil. You know, he's like one of those toys with like one of those little windmills on the back of it. You just wind that boy up and you just let him go. I mean, he is, uh, he is sweet, but he's, every time he walks past me in the house, he tries to punch me. I'm like, good for you, son. Good for you. He never punches his mommy, you know, but just for me, it's like we're always wrestling and fighting. I'll bite him, you know, those kind of things. Healthy, healthy. You know, so we thought like our family was good, you know, and then, and then we moved to Ohio and we had an Ohio baby and God gave us, we ran out of names, so we let Cana pick the name. She's like, let's name him Isaac. We're like, great. You know, perfect. So, we, you know, we've got three kids, but what, I, what I'm trying to tell you is like, you think it's good until the, the next one comes. Watch, watch, watch. You think that the, the wall is doing okay. Without your brick. You think that the church is doing okay. Without your story. You think that everything looks good from the outside. And you think what happens is we feel like we're insignificant. So we think that our story or our brick or our stone does not matter. Because we think everything is okay. But I want you to see as good as it is. It would be so much better when you place your brick next to my brick. Listen, the kingdom of God, this community, this church, this area, you matter to God and your story and your unique gifting and your place in the wall matters to God. You can't look at it and say they're doing just fine. Yes, we are doing fine, but we could be doing better with you involved, connected. Because your place in the wall matters. You matter. You matter to God. You matter to me. You matter to this leadership team. Your place in his wall, in this church, in this body, in this local expression of his church matters. And so we've got to do the work of living from the new heart and renewing our mind so that whatever is holding us back, we deal with those things so that we can place our brick next to the wall because you and me, we are living stones built on the foundation of the apostle and the prophet and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We are building his church. You matter. Your place matters. And here's what I've, here's what I've found. Um, here's what I found. Is that we, there, there are things that try and hold us back from finding our place in the wall. What, we, what happens is the enemy wants to try and lie to us and make us feel like we are prisoners of our past or of our environment or of our circumstances. And I don't know everything that keeps people from finding their place in the wall, but I want to give you what I think are three really good ones. I think these are three really, really good ones. Um, if you disagree, that's okay. The real preacher will be back in March, and uh, it'll be just fine. But why don't people find their place in the wall? I think number one is because they've been hurt. They've been hurt. I can't tell you, like, how many times I've had the thought of, like, man, this is just not worth it. I'll just go serve Jesus in a cabin in a hill by myself with my family. Like, the church, my God, church, help us, Jesus. Am I right? 
Like, I've been hurt by the church. You stick around long enough, you will be hurt by the church. Like, I, I, I ask this question, God, if you are so good, like, why in your sovereignty are, do you use people? We are messed up. Like, we keep getting this wrong. People don't want to get involved and they don't want to find their place because of, because of hurt. And I want to say two things about hurt. Number one, if you are hurt and that's why you're not finding your place in the wall, listen to me, that is okay. It is just not okay to stay there. Right? Like if you are hurt and you've been, like if you've been really hurt by church, by church leadership, by, I mean, whatever, whatever your story is, like let us walk alongside of you because that's not God's best for you. To spend your whole Christian, Christian life detached from community, sneaking into church 12 times a year, like, that's not God's best for you. That's not his redemptive plan for your life. If you've been hurt, it's okay, but Jesus is strong enough to heal the hurt. Amen? Amen. And then secondly, if you have been hurt, you do not want to let it be an excuse for why you don't find your place in the wall. If you are hurt and you are looking to be hurt, then that's all you're ever going to find. You'll be offended the moment that you walk through the doors because the weather is cold. Well, heaven forbid, I had nothing to do with the weather, but you're mad at me. We did worship too long. We did worship too short. The music's too loud. The preacher's too loud. Like if, you're look, if you've been hurt and you're looking for hurt, you'll never find your place in the wall. You'll never find your place in community. And that's not God's best for you. And you don't want to go through life a brick just out there on your own because you've been hurt. You belong to each other. We belong to each other. We belong in community. And I know that church has hurt you. And I know that people have let you down. But I promise you, Jesus will never hurt you. He will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. And Jesus is strong enough to heal every hurt that you have, been de- that you have, that you have felt. Either, either Jesus is strong enough to save us from hell. Write our name in his book. Like, the gospel does not just stop there. He can, if he can deliver us from the miry clay, set us on the rock to stay, then Jesus is powerful enough to set us free so that we don't have to live in the bondage of hurt. If we have to wait till we go to heaven to experience freedom, then death is our savior and Jesus is not. Either he is strong enough to save a sinner from their sins and he is strong enough to heal a broken heart or he is not. I'm telling you, man, that God can set you free. That your place is better and connected to the wall because you and me, us and we are living stones. We are building a holy temple for the Lord on the foundation of the apostle and the prophet. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. This is his house. Amen? All right, all right, just relax, everybody. Here we go. Now, we've been hurt. Another reason we don't want to find our place in the wall is because we need forgiveness. And usually the person that you need to forgive is yourself. Usually the person that you're most frustrated with and most mad at is yourself. I cannot believe I let myself do that. I cannot believe I let myself trust another person, trust another pastor, try another church. What we do is we are are mad 
at ourselves. And so we don't find our place in the wall. We need to forgive. We need to receive forgiveness. And then number three, we need to give forgiveness. Listen, I am not perfect. I am not perfect. Um, Pastor Juan, I know he's good. I know he's good. I know he brings the salsa, you know. But he's not perfect. Right? Like, it's not our heart. It's not my heart to ever hurt you to a point where I turn you off from the church and turn you off from Jesus. That is not the heart of, of this leadership. I can promise you that. Right? If it was, I wouldn't be here, and I don't think you would either. But we need to, we need to give forgiveness. We need to give forgiveness. We got to do these things so that we can find our place in the wall. Paul says it like this in Ephesians chapter 4. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one each other, to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Jesus Christ, forgave you. I know, I know, it can be tough. But the mission is worth it. To reach one more for Jesus is worth it. To see somebody move from darkness to light is worth it. To see somebody's name written in his book, that's worth it. And so we've got to do the, the work of renewing the mind, living from the new heart so that we can find our place in the wall. Number three, not only is Jesus our Nehemiah, not only is he your Nehemiah, my Nehemiah, Jesus is greater than Nehemiah. Jesus is greater than Nehemiah. Nehemiah was building a wall. Not a metaphorical wall. Like he was actually building the walls, right? Jesus is building something greater. He's greater than Nehemiah. In Luke chapter 4, when he shows up at the synagogue and they hand him the scroll, the scroll he reads from Isaiah 61. I want to read Isaiah 61 and I want to show you what it, here's what it says. Here's what he's reading. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor, it's here. And with it, the day of God's anger against his enemies. Like, watch the gospel message in here, that God is going to do something in you so he can do something through you. Verse 3 says like this, To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, that's my righteousness and your righteousness. Because we have received his righteousness. Right now, we are, if we are in Christ, we, we are righteous. They will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his glory. Like Jesus comes with this message. He comes on mission to do something to the brokenhearted. But then the work is so deep that you become the righteousness of God that is planted for his glory. Like he does something so unique and powerful on the inside of us that we now join his mission so that we can give him glory. Then in verse 4, here's what it says it's about you and me. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will rebuild pair cities destroyed long ago and they will revive them though they have been deserted for many generations rebuild repair revive rebuild repair revive rebuild repair revive this is what God wants to do through you and me Together, when we do the hard work, 
of letting Jesus touch our hearts so that we can get over that hurt, so that we can give forgiveness, so that we can forgive as freely as we have been forgiven, so that we can find our place on the wall, so that we can find our place as a living stone built for the, in his temple, built for his glory. Then we rebuild, we repair, we revive, we become messengers of his glory. This is what it's about. That we are not called to do this Christian life on our own. And I'm not naive to think that, that there's not been something that has gone on in your life that has hurt you or frustrated you or, that, or the enemy wants to keep you from getting connected. But I'm telling you that the redemptive work of the cross and the resurrection Jesus is powerful enough and then you can find your place in the wall because there is a work to be done there's a work to be done to rebuild to repair and to revive Jesus is greater than Nehemiah amen Nehemiah was building and repairing rebuilding a wall Jesus is expanding his kingdom. Nehemiah was using stones. Jesus is building with people. Nehemiah was fighting for victory. Jesus has already won the victory. Jesus is greater than Nehemiah. And you know, Jesus wins. He wins, man. He's awesome. Amen? So I want to end with this scripture. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18. It's our key scripture. I told them that the hand of my God had been upon me for good and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let's rise up and build. And then they strengthened their hands for the good work. I want to tell you that the work, the good work, the gospel, the good news, um, it's worth it. It is so worth it. And I love his church. And I love his people. And until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, I'm committed to this thing. And my call to you today is whatever it is, whatever work you've got to do, however you've got to renew your mind, whatever healing you've got to experience, I'm calling you. It's a good work. Find your place in the wall. Let Jesus touch that hurt, that disappointment, that frustration. Let him heal that thing. Get forgiveness. Forgive yourself. Forgive others. Because I know it looks like the wall is doing just fine, but it could be doing so much better with you connected to it. Amen? This is a good work. I'm going to ask just for a minute, if we could all stand to our feet. I just feel like um, what I want to say about what I want to say about you is what I, I believe that you want to be a part of a good work that God is doing. You want to be a part of what God is doing, this good, good work. That's why you're here. You're not here to check off some religious checkmark box and just go through your religious duties you're here I believe because you love God and you want to be a part of what he is doing amen so before we close can we as a church can we as the temple of God can we as living stones can we on the foundation of the apostle and prophet can we with Jesus as our chief cornerstone 
Can we just worship together one more time? And then, I'll just, then we'll dismiss and we'll close. But there's nothing like, there's nothing like the church being the church and worshiping together, finding our place in the wall and connecting with other believers and being a part of a good work. Amen? You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Far from you are all things, and to you are all things you deserve. Come on, every voice. You're worthy of it all. prayer team to come move out of your seats, come down front. If you're here today and you need prayer for anything, anything at all, physical, emotional, salvation, anything, um, our prayer team will be down front. We would love to partner with you and pray with you for whatever you're believing for, whatever Jesus victory you're believing for. We want to we partner our faith with yours and believe God for a Jesus victory. And then lastly, as you leave, I just want to encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me through this message? What do I need to do? Who do I need to forgive? What, what's my next step? And if you know what that is, I want to encourage you to take it. Maybe it's stopping by our tables in the lobby, finding your brick, writing your name, getting connected grabbing the program. On the inside of the program, there's an insert that says, count me interested. Whatever your next step is, ask the Holy Spirit and then do it today. Do it before you leave. Do it before you leave. Uh, before we leave, I want to just speak a blessing over you. So if you would extend your hand or put a hand on your heart, in the name of Jesus, in that name which is above every other name I bless you today I bless you to not just be hearers of the word but to be doers of the word I bless you to know that you matter your story matters your place matters that your stone in the wall it matters that you matter to God I bless you today to know that the Lord your God wins victory after victory and he's always with you he celebrates and sings because of you and he will refresh your life with his love. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, can we just give Jesus some praise? Hey, love you, love you, love you. Have a great, great rest of your day. We'll see you next week.